Am I going to be hog tied right there or can I walk around? Stay right there? Okay. He's wanting to film there, and so he's hog tying me right here. Well, good evening, y'all. It's good to be here. Um, we had snow this week at home. <laughs> So it's a little warmer here than it's been up in, in the mountains of East Tennessee. So help me understand why y'all are here. Anybody tell me why y'all are here tonight? Anybody? Reinforce what's good for us. Okay. What's your goals? What's your goals tonight that you're wanting? Long life. A long life? Okay. Anyone else? Healthy life. A healthy life. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, let's talk about it. Yes? My husband is chronically sick and wants to get off the medication. Okay, so for the folks out there, her husband is chronically sick and wants to get off the medication. Okay, why does he want to get off the medicine? Pardon? It's complicated. Side effects? That could be one. Yeah. Yes? So that we can learn and share. You can learn and share. You know, that's very true. Uh, today, we finished up a two-week program in Africa. Um, four and a half years ago, uh, went and started a program in Rwanda. And it's a, it's a lifestyle program. It's, uh, it's um, from 8 o'clock in the morning till 5 at night. It's, an, it's not an inpatient program, but it's where people come in. And they, um, we have them from 8 in the morning till 5 at night for 14 straight days. Except on Sabbath, they come just for the morning and we, we have Sabbath school and church and then they go home. But the rest of the time, it's, it's intense. And um, they come with all kinds of diseases. And um, they want to change. They want lifestyle change. They want to feel better. And it's amazing how we see as they apply these basic laws that we're going to talk about tonight... Their diseases change. Uh, last time I was there, um, I started going there, and now they're just running with it, and I'm just a guest speaker now. But um, the last time I was there, we had a lady come in, and her uh, blood glucose was, well, it's 399, right at 400. She was on insulin. She was on metformin. Ambulation was very poor to a walker, uh, so she had poor gait. And in two weeks' time, um, her, she could ambulate on her own without walker. Um, blood sugar was 115. That's morning fasting. And uh, she was off insulin and off metformin. Isn't that amazing? By just doing this right here. Real simple. Um, the time before that, there was a lady. She was about the same. Uh, ran that 400 marker, insulin and metformin. And in two, also had ambulation issues. She was in a wheelchair when she came in. Uh, when, within two weeks, she was ambulating on her own, and um, her, her blood sugar was at 124, but she was off insulin, off metformin, in just 14 days. So it's amazing how fast this works. When I left healthcare, regular healthcare, um, I remember corporate, you know, I told them I was going to go work uh, in lifestyle health where you could reverse type 2 diabetes. And they said, well, looked at me straight in the eye and said, Walt, you are crazy. It's going to ruin your reputation in healthcare. And then Mary Lou says, sometimes I don't keep my mouth shut. And, and so I said, you can even improve type 1 diabetes. And then they looked at me and said, Walt, you are stupid. You cannot do that. Well, guess what? You know, we see over a 98% reversal of type 2 diabetes. It's easier to reverse type 2 diabetes than it is toenail fungus. And type 1 diabetes... Yes, it is difficult, especially outside the honeymoon phase, to reverse that. We ain't figured that one out yet. But we can see a person who comes in with insulin, say, 60, 80 units a day, go to 5 to 10. Is that reversed? No, but is it improved? Yes. So it's, it's amazing. And as you look at reversing disease, and that's what I'm getting, I'm hearing y'all say, is... I'm just an old country boy. You know, I grew up on a farm, as she, as she said. And so you have to look at, y'all know what horse sense is? Common sense. 
So if I have a piece of sandpaper and I'm rubbing my arm, and you come say, honey, let me put some medicine on there, and you put medicine on it, and then you leave and I go rubbing it with sandpaper again. And you come back next day and put more medicine on it, and you leave and I go rubbing the sandpaper, and then you put med. Is it going to heal? No, not till I stop this. And so that's what we're going to talk about this weekend is ident- see, the cure is in the cause. Take away the cause. The cure is not in the pharmacological aspect to learning what, what pharmaceutical items which will manage and mask signs and symptoms. The issue is understanding physiology that we can change the cause and then disease goes away. But just as she said, as I, as I told the folks in Rwanda yesterday, I said, don't be selfish. Don't just keep this information to yourself. You know, yes, apply it to yourself, but go home what you learned this weekend and share it with your family. Share it with your neighbors. Share it with your coworkers. Share it with other people and help them to feel better also. And that's, that's a goal. So tonight we're going to look at laws of health. Can we go to just where we click the bottom there so we get the full thing? Uh, will that part go away if you click? Yeah, there you go. Excellent. All right. Thank you. So on your, y'all, I think y'all have this page. So if y'all want to get a hold of us, you can do that QR code. You can, um, that will, you can send that and save it as contacts. That will give you our phone number, our address, our, our website, our YouTube page, our, our Facebook page. It'll just give you all kinds of stuff about us and where you can go. And, and we do a lot of training online. And so you can go to that to, to get to that. But lifestyle to health. Tonight I'd like to talk about keys to health or laws of health. If I take this and I, and I let go, what's going to happen? It's going to fall. And that's the law of gravity. So let's look at keys or laws that are going to happen regarding health. That's just physiology, human physiology. Um, anybody ever grow up on a farm besides a couple? Anybody? Anybody else? Anybody ever drive a tractor? Okay. But grew up on a farm. Anybody drive a tractor? Okay, so let's say we're driving the tractor. It's hard to hog time, y'all. Um, let's say we're driving the tractor, and you're, you're picking up hay, and you're, you, know, you pull it back up on your, on your lift, lift goes up, and you're hauling your, your bale of hay over to put it on the wagon, and you notice that the, bale, that, that the lift goes down. And so you pull it back, it goes back up, but as you're going, it goes back down. What's the problem? Hydraulic. Something's going on with hydraulics. And you look behind you, and you notice that you're trailing liquid. Now you got two choices. You can get you a hired hand. You all know what a hired hand is? You can get you a hired hand and you can pay them to sit up on the tractor with a five gallon bucket of hydraulic fluid and pour it in the tractor. Or you can fix that leak. Well that's our goal this weekend is identify where that leak is and fix the leak. So many times in the first 20 years of my working We were the hired hand that y'all paid to pour hydraulic fluid in. But it doesn't fix the root cause. And so that's our goal, is to learn that. And so we look to keys to health. And yes, we can have trauma. Yes, lifestyle can make a difference in full health. But I'm also a fire chief in our mountain community. And I work a lot of wrecks on the interstate, on I-40. And there's times that people are heading down the interstate the wrong direction. And boom, that's not your fault. And you get, in a, you get in a car wreck, you have a compound fracture, you got the bone sticking out, and we fly you to UT. That's a different situation. That's a, an acute problem, a trauma situation. But what I'm going to talk about this weekend is more so uh, chronic, not acute. Now, what's the difference? You have, what's a word that we think, a diagnosis that we say the word chronic? Fatigue. Pardon? Fatigue. Okay. But is there a diagnosis that use the word, uses the word chronic in it? Chronic fatigue syndrome. Okay. Chronic fatigue syndrome. Okay. Another one? Diabetes. Pardon? Diabetes. Diabetes, but in the name of the disease, like? Asthma. 
Oh, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Now, there was an, uh, an anesthesiologist that was trying to, to change it to colds, chronic obstructive lung disease, because they didn't think folks knew what pulmonary was, but it really didn't fly. But um, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. Disease, so what diseases are within COPD? Used to be three, now there's two. Asthma, emphysema, emphysema bronchitis. chronic bronchitis. Asthma used to be there, but about six, seven years ago, we pull, they pulled out asthma, so it's separate now, but it used to be there. So, so if you have, say, emphysema, do you get that tonight driving home if you smoke? No, it's chronic over a long period of time. And so a lot of health issues like diabetes you talked about or digestive issues, uh, say ulcerative colitis, Crohn's, uh, IBS, those are chronic long-term issues. That's what we're more so talking about this weekend, not acute situations such as what many times we see in the emergency department. But what are some keys to health that we can address his health issues instead of having to just mask and manage? The first key I'd like to look at is the fuel that you put in your body. Fuel's important. Um, according to Harvard, proper nutrition helps keep energy levels up and protects against many age-related illnesses and diseases like heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. The fuel that you put in your body can make the difference in your health. Huge. It really is. Um, I remember one time, uh, this has been years ago, uh, probably about 43 years ago, worked a house fire in Chattanooga, and it was, we fought the fire all night, and the driver came back to the fire hall, and we had two fuel pumps. We had a diesel pump, and we had a gas pump. And I don't remember which the truck was, but he filled it with the wrong fuel. Is that a problem? Fortunately, he realized that, and he had turned the, the truck off, and we just left the truck till the mechanic came in the next day, draining the fuel. If you put the wrong fuel in your vehicle, is that going to cause problems? Yes. It's the same with, with the human body also. Some fuel is better fuel. Um, I made a mistake a couple weeks ago. I was traveling to Birmingham, and I put the high test in instead of the, the low-grade fuel. Did my vehicle run better? It did run better. I mean, I had more zip. Um, but uh, what if I had a high-falutin car that had to run on high test and you put regular in it, you might have problems. And so that's what we're going to talk about here. Um, dietary, this is the United States Surgeon General. Dietary excess and imbalance causes much disease and death. Diet has a vital influence on health. Five of the top 10 killers are directly related to diet. Here's five of them that the Surgeon General identifies. Actually, the other five I believe diet contributes to those, but this is what the Surgeon General says, and I agree with him. This includes heart disease. <clears throat> Do you think diet affects heart disease? <clears throat> How about cancer? Absolutely can. Stroke, diabetes, and atherosclerosis, that's clogged arteries. Continue with the Surgeon General. <clears throat> it is clear <clears throat> that diet contributes in substantial ways to the development of these diseases. And that modification of diet contribute, can contribute to their prevention and control. And I say also the reversal of those diseases. When was that written? <clears throat> Pardon? When was that written by chance? You want to guess? Uh, 60s. 1988. That's been a long time, y'all. 1988. Yeah, good question. This is Understanding Nutrition. This is a nutrition book that you see if you were in collegiate level of nutrition. Every day, several times a day, you, find, you make food choices that influence your body's health for better or for worse. So the food choices that we make can influence your body's health for better or for worse. So as I was talking to the folks these last two weeks in Rwanda, um, 
it's, it's very interesting as I look at Kuala Lumpur. Anybody ever heard of Kuala Lumpur? Say KL in Indonesia. Prior to KL being a major city, the diseases in KL were, were infection. But when KL became, Kuala Lumpur, became you know, vital like it is today, they started getting diseases like diabetes, obesity, heart disease, those type of issues. And I asked them prior to KL becoming, you know, a huge metropolitan area, or, or um, well, we'll just call it that, what were the diseases in KL, Inf you know, infection? What was the food that they ate? Rice, fruit, vegetables, some meat. I asked them after they became more affluent, before the American diseases happened, what were they eating? You know what the first one they mentioned? Now, this is from the Minister of Health. Wendy's. Number two is Pizza Hut. And then they continue down the American fast food chain. And I see that true in Rwanda. As I go to Rwanda, and as I go to rural Rwanda, where the folks are very slim, they don't have these, say, called syndrome X. Um, they, they have infections, mostly. It's the same as in, uh, Indonesia. But guess what happens in Kigali, which has 3 million people? President Paul wants R Rwanda to be uh, Singapore of Africa by uh, 2030. I mean, they're be becoming very affluent there in Kigali. They're, they're getting bigger. They're starting to have diseases that we have here in America. And guess what I see when I go there that they're eating? American fast food. Plus, they like donuts. And, and so donuts are big. Uh, you'd think they were policemen. Uh, that's what firefighters use. Um, that's what we say about policemen. So every day, several times a day, you make food choices that influence your body's health for better or for worse. The brain is the, is the organ and instrument of the mind <clears throat> and controls the whole body. In order for the other parts of the system to be healthy, the brain must be healthy. And in order for the brain to be healthy, the blood must be pure. If by correct habits of eating and drinking, the blood is kept pure, the brain will be properly nursed. So this is physiology. It's kind of like what's first, the chicken or the egg? Well, we all know the chicken was before the egg, based on what? Creation. Yeah. But as we look at issues with the body, is there a, is there an, is there a direct relationship with the brain and gut health? Yes. Absolutely there is. And they kind of go back and forth. <clears throat> but here we're saying, before you treat health problems in the body, you've got to treat the brain, because brain health affects the rest of the body. Do you agree with that? We're told that nine-tenths, 90% of health issues are due to brain issues. Now, that doesn't mean you're crazy. What's the number one diagnosis in America? Stress. Uh, anxiety Well. It was depression, we'll talk about this tomorrow, but now, post-COVID, we're seeing anxiety even more than depression. I mean, anxiety just went nuts post-COVID. I've got a buddy of mine, he's in, he, he's, um, um, he specializes in uh, brain function, he's a neurologist, and he tells me, Walt, just since COVID, he has so many more patients coming in that are dealing with anxiety issues. Well, you wouldn't think that would be a neurology issue, but they're coming with neurology issues, but they're just super anxiety issues with these patients now. So if a person has a brain issue, could that be stress? Sure. Could that be anxiety? Yeah. Could that be depression? Yep. There's a lot of that out there today. And can that affect physiology of other health issues? Absolutely, it can. And so, before you treat the body, you've got to treat the brain. But in order to treat the brain, you've got to treat the fuel system to the brain. And that is the blood. And how do you treat the blood? It's what you eat and what you drink. Yes, there's other things that affect the blood. You know, you've got your hydration. You know, you've got to have water in the blood. You've got to have hormones in the blood. You've got to have, you know, a number of things in there. 
But what's most important is the fats, proteins, and, uh, and uh, uh, fats, proteins, carbohydrates. You got to have the vitamins, which is the catalyst to kick on the fats, proteins, carbohydrates. You got to have the minerals that kick on the vitamins, which kick on the fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. And so you got to have adequate nutrition, balanced nutrition. And we don't get that in processed foods. Kigali is not getting that today, eating donuts or eating McDonald's. You know what's interesting in Kigali? They don't have a McDonald's that has a drive through you got to you got to walk into to, to uh, in Kigali, but in, in, in Kuala Lumpur, you can drive in there. Um, so to treat the body, you got to treat the brain. To treat the brain, you got to treat the blood. And how you treat the blood is what you eat and what you drink primarily. And this is interesting. First Corinthians ten thirty one. Um, it could you could just say whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Would that be conclusive? It would be conclusive. But why does it say whether therefore you eat or drink? God loves us. He's given us a tip. You know, like the fourth commandment says, remember it. Because folks are going to forget it. He says, remember this one. Folks are going to forget this one. And so here he says, guys, be careful what you eat and you drink. Now, we're going to look at these laws of health, which we have right here. We're going to look at those tonight. <clears throat> but I'm going to speak significantly on brain function. Why am I talking about brain function? Well, I don't have time to talk about all the other functions. And so I'm going to pick one organ. And what's the most important organ in the body? Our brain. Now, some folks say it's the heart. Some people say it's the gut, the system of the gut. But I say it's the brain. Why is the brain the most important organ in the body? Okay, it controls the whole body, absolutely. But let's jump up a couple stories. Why is the brain the most important organ in the body? Okay, controls everything else. What else? What's the... Pardon? Okay, you make choices, you're getting there. Even higher than that, spiritual. It's how we make right decisions spiritually. It's how we communicate with God. It's how he, how we, he communicates with us. And so you've got to take care of the brain in order for the brain to, yes, control the whole body. But the other one is to discern God's word. And I believe in that. One of the cool things about living in the South and, and y'all are in the South, uh, is that we can talk about that. When I was, when Marilyn and I were in Sweden last year for two weeks teaching, 87% of Swedes profess to be atheist. It's difficult to have this conversation. I go to Portland, Oregon. It's difficult to have this conversation. I go to Seattle. It's difficult to have this conversation. I go to LA. It's difficult to have this conversation. Uh, next week, Next week, I'll be in South Dakota. The week after that, well, it'll be okay there. But the week after that, guess where I'll be? New York City. It's a little tougher to have this conversation. But I believe this is important because whatever we do, lifestyle, it is God that does the healing. Yes, diet and these other issues are important, but I believe it is God that does the healing. Think about it. This is Harvard. So I'm going to speak, be speaking from Harvard. I'm going to be speaking from Mayo Clinic. I'm going to be speaking from Cleveland Clinic tonight. Think about it. Your brain is always on. It takes care of your thoughts and movements, your breathing, your heartbeat, your senses. It works 24-7 even while you're asleep. This means your brain requires a constant supply of fuel. That's 24 hours a day. That fuel comes from the foods you eat. This is Harvard. And what's in that fuel makes all the difference. Put simply, what you eat directly affects the structure and function of your brain and ultimately your mood. But not only does it affect your brain, what else does it affect? Every other cell in the body. What we eat determines the quality of every cell in the body. Whether it's your pancreas, whether it's your gallbladder, whatever. And that can affect every disease out there. Like an expensive car. I got this guy. He comes to see me. And he has this, this car. And 
he got it from Dodge. He bought it in town. And um, he had it chipped out. And it, any guys or any gals like cars? You know, any car people? Okay. So this car has 800 and something horsepower. It's a Hellcat. And um, it's yellow in color. And it has 800 and some horsepower. It's, he had it chipped out the, the fastest that Dodge would produce it. First gas tank, and it wasn't even at 500 miles is when it then really would do what it needs to do. But he was only at the first gas tank, and so it wasn't full performance. And it he said he was getting two point something miles to the gallon. It just wasn't fast enough for him. Can you imagine that? A car that has 800 and some horsepower and it wasn't fast enough for this guy. This guy's 70 some years old. So he calls up this guy in Level Cross, North Carolina. North Carolina. Who lives in Level Cross? Right outside of Randleman. He wears a cowboy hat. Some people call him the king of NASCAR. That's right, Mr. Petty. He calls up Mr. Petty, Richard Petty. So he sends this Dodge Hellcat. He has it trailered from Newport, Tennessee, over to Level Cross, North Carolina. And Mr. Petty's crew totally tore the car apart, apart at 300 miles. That's all he had on it, 300 miles. Rebuilds the engine. He, uh, the, literally, the, the oil pan dropped that much more. He put a bigger oil pan on it. Um, he took the fuel system off, and he put now two fuel pumps on it, and each fuel line had three quarters of an inch diameter fuel line. Um, I mean, he totally changed that car. Had, now has 1,500 horsepower, 1,500 horsepower. Um, and Mr. Petty says, you now have a race car. He says, you cannot buy gasoline at a gas station. He says, you have to have 115 octane. Uh, if you put regular gas in your car, it will ruin the engine. Our bodies, God built us as race cars. And sometimes we put fuel that doesn't make it run as good. So like an expensive car, your brain functions best when it gets only premium fuel, eating high quality fuels that contain lots of vitamins, minerals, and antioxidants, nourishes the brain and protects it from oxidative stress. The waste, free radicals, produced when the body uses oxygen, which can damage cells. Unfortunately, just like an expensive car, your brain can be damaged if you ingest anything other than premium fuel. Now, I was talking to a lady flying, flying down today from Charlotte, and this lady some high fluting person on Wall Street. And she was talking about making the choices of what you eat. This lady understood that where you, where you go in the grocery store determines how well your body runs. She says, do not go to the middle aisles. This lady is some highfalutin person on Wall Street. She understood that. Where do you go? The produce section. You know, yes, you can go to the beans. Yes, you can go to the frozen section of fruits and vegetables or whatever. But it's the processed foods. It's the middle of the store that really can make you sick. And where's the best place to get food? Your backyard. Grow your own food. You know what the soil is. You know what seeds you're using. You know what's been sprayed on it. That is the best fuel. If substances from low premium fuel, such as what you get from processed or refined foods, gets to the brain, has little ability to get rid of them. Isn't that amazing? So if you eat a Twinkie, it has a hard time getting rid of the waste from that processed food. Is it easy to eat processed foods? People come to me and they say, well, I don't have time to cook. Well, if you are heading to work and you're low on fuel and you say, I'm going to be late to work and you don't take time to get fuel, are you going to make it to work? It's going to take you longer if you don't fill up with gas. We need to fill up with good fuel to make the body run or you're going to have consequences down the road. And a lot of times people come to me, they're in their 
probably in the average 60s is when they're really starting to find problems. 60s, 70s, 80s. Yes, some in their 50s. I'm seeing younger and younger people coming in with health issues. And it's the fuel that they're putting in their bodies. But the sad thing is, is Mary Lou and I have people come in to talk to us about health issues. And whether it's diabetes, whether it's heart disease, whether it's whatever it might be. And we sit down and I get a, an assessment and I do a history and part of that history is nutrition. And I start sharing with them physiology on what they need to start eating and they'll say, I'm not going to do that. That ain't going to work. I had a guy just, was it yesterday? That ain't going to happen. I'm not changing what I'm going to eat. Can I help them further? I can't. Because you've got to get to root cause to fix the problem. I can't make them. God don't make us do things. How can I make someone else do something? So they have to make a choice. So my, jo my job is to provide information for them to make an informed decision. But it's their choice on what, what they do with that information. So it's interesting here, Harvard says, if substance is from low premium fuel, as what you're getting from processed or refined foods, gets to the brain, it has little ability to get rid of them, and we need to get rid of the waste. Do we want that junk just staying in our brain, the waste? No. Diets high in refined sugars, for example, are harmful to the brain. What's a really popular high ref, refined sugar out there? High fructose corn syrup. It's in your ketchup. It's in your sweet pickles. It's in almost everything. You're right, soft drinks. It's in so much of our food today. And what does Harvard say? Diets in high refined sugar, so we could just say diets in high fructose corn syrup, for example, are harmful to the brain. Why do we do it then? Yes? Are we allowed to ask a question? Absolutely. So what's the difference between high fructose, high fructose corn syrup and corn syrup? Same thing. Same thing. Yes, ma'am. Yes. And now you're dealing with a couple issues here. One is just the processed aspect, but the other is we're seeing issues with wheat today. Uh, I go into Minnesota um, last year. I was there a couple times. But I go into an area of Minnesota that grows wheat. And I, I get there sometimes when I go is in the harvest time. And it looks like everything is dead. Why? They just sprayed it with Roundup. Now, who grows a garden? Or who, who has ever grown a garden? So let's say that you're, it's, you're growing. Well, let's see here. This is April. Okay. Strawberries are in right now, right? Pardon? Okay, so don't grow here? Oh, you're done. Okay. So what's growing right now? Mangoes. Okay, so let's go mangoes. So you're growing mangoes, and you say, hmm, I'd love to have a mango. So you go out to your mangoes, and you say, I'm going to pick me some mangoes tomorrow. So you go out there today, and you spray the mangoes with Roundup. Are you going to eat those mangoes tomorrow? No. Or let's say it's strawberry time over in uh, Lakeland, uh, Plant City. Plant City probably has more strawberries. And so I think it's this time, April, when, when they're growing over in, in Plant City, March and April. And so you go out there and the, over in, in, in Lakeland or Plant City, and so they go, they're, they're going to pick a mess of them tomorrow, and they spray them with Roundup. Are you going to eat those? That's what we do with our wheat. We spray our wheat with Roundup, and then we go out and we cut it and we eat it. That's one of the big issues that we have the issues we have with, with wheat sensitivity. But guess what else we do it with? We do it with soybeans. We do it with corn. We're now doing it with alfalfa. And those of y'all who grew up on a farm knows the importance of alfalfa. And um, it's Roundup Ready. So as we look at high fructose corn syrup, 
we're now seeing research that just came out last year, the same problems that we're seeing with wheat intolerance, we're seeing with corn, identical, but I'm not surprised because it's super hybridized. It's, 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 it's also sprayed with Roundup, so I'm not surprised to see the same health issues. And so when you're eating the high fructose corn syrup, you're eating Roundup. You're eating super hybridized or super, you know, your genetically modified product. Uh, so diets in high refined sugar, for example, are harmful to the brain. In addition to worsening your body's relation to insulin, relation of ins regulation of insulin, they also promote inflammation and oxidative stress. Well, guess what Harvard says is the number one cause of inflammation. Anybody have problems with inflammation? It's huge. We have to have inflammation, just like we have to have cholesterol, but we gotta have the right amount. Harvard says the number one cause, or the number one, yeah, the number one cause of inflammation in the United States is processed foods. Processed foods cause inflammation, and that's what they're saying right here. Uh, they also promote inflammation and oxidative stress. Multiple studies uh, have found a correlation between a diet and refined sugars and impaired brain function. Do you want impaired brain function? Do you want your spouse to have impaired brain function, ladies? <laughs> Pardon? Well, most of the, some guys will, will cook, but most of it's the ladies that are doing the cooking who are responsible putting the food on the table. And so what you put on the table determines what your husband and kids act like or the health of you. Now, some guys cook. When we got married, Mary Lou says, my daddy didn't cook, so I don't want you cooking. Plus, my grandma taught me, my grandmothers, my great-grandmother and my mama taught me how to cook Southern. And that's not the best food to eat. And so Mary Lou's a whole lot better cook than me and a lot healthier cook than I know. So do you want, whoever puts the food on the table, you determine the health of your spouse and whoever else eats there, your children, your grandchildren, or whoever. And that's what Harvard's telling us here. So there's a direct correlation between a diet and high uh, refined sugars and impaired brain function. Do you want your spouse to have a good brain function, your children to have good brain functions? Do you want them to have ADDH or ADHD or whatever the letters are they're calling it now? Mm -hmm. And even a worsening of symptoms of mood disorders such as depression. Well, definitely there's issues of mood disorders in people out there. Would you agree? Yeah. And Harvard talks a lot on this issue of mood disorders based on what we eat. It makes sense. If your brain is deprived of good quality nutrition or if free radicals or damaging inflammatory cells are circling within the brain's closed space, further contributing to tissue injury, consequences are to what? Be expected. If I take the sandpaper and I'm rubbing my arm, is it expected that I'm going to wear the hide off my arm? It's just expected. That's just physiology. And Harvard says it's expected that you're going to have consequences if we eat processed foods. What's interesting is that for many years, the medical field did not fully acknowledge the correlation, connection between mood and food. Today, continuing with Harvard here, today, fortunately, the field of nutrition psychiatry or uh, is finding there are many consequences and correlations between not only what you eat, how you feel, and how you ultimately behave, but also the kinds of bacteria that live in your gut. And that's a whole weekend that we could talk on gut biome. That's a huge issue out there. And we're not even getting that today. So the fuel that you put in your body, in your family's body, determines their health. And that's huge. Who's ever ridden on a steam train? Anybody ridden on a steam train? Come up to Dollywood, and we got a steam train. It'll take you up the mountain. Well, did you know there's even different qualities of coal? Some coal has more BTU, and they use that better coal to run that steam train. But what if you put toilet paper in that train? Is it going to have the power to heat that water to, turn, to make steam to turn them wheels to pull the cars. No, 
So sometimes, though, we're not putting good coal in the body. We're putting toilet paper, processed foods. What are some good fuels for the brain? Who's from, who's from, we don't have any Caribbean. Anybody, y'all from the Caribbean? Y'all don't do avocados in the Caribbean, do you? <laughs> y'all very fortunate here in South Florida that y'all can grow avocados. Avocados are the number one brain food that we found. Um, it's a good fat, but it is the number one. It's also a good source of potassium. It's just a, a very good food. Uh, beets are good for the brain. We're talking brain food here. Blueberries, broccoli, celery. You wouldn't think of celery being good brain food, but it is. It's also a great source of, of um, sodium. If you're ever juicing, anybody ever done a juice fast? Um, sometimes people who do long-term juice fast, say for 60 days, they can have a sodium deficiency. So instead of using two stalks of celery, just go to four stalks in each juice, and I have found that usually provides adequate sodium, and you're not going to have a sodium issue. Green leafy vegetables, rosemary, turmeric. Turmeric's huge, y'all. Uh, potatoes, asparagus, great f fuel for the brain. Walnuts. Walnuts are the number one uh, nut for the brain. English walnut is the number one nut for the brain. Black walnuts is a good one. Uh, black walnut actually has a better PS ratio for the heart. English walnuts are next. Uh, uh, black walnuts has the, the best PS ratio, polyunsaturated divided by saturated. But for brain function, black walnut, I mean English walnuts works better. The second key, WHO, Health, uh, World Health Organization, and the CDC, P, I should change that, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, identify the second key or second law. Psychology Today reports, who's ever heard of the, doc, the, uh, uh, the this magazine Psychology Today? Oh, there you go. Neuroscientists around the globe agree that, physio, uh, that physical activity is the best medication to maintain brain health throughout one's lifespan. So anybody out there on psychotropics, would you rather take Thorazine, would you rather take Haldol, or would you rather take exercise? Now, in 1988, HICFA, Healthcare Finance Administration, re-looked at psychotropics. You're going to be amazed at this. And I added new, new drugs out there that were psychotropics to the psychotropic list. Uh, Benadryl went on the psychotropic list in 1988. They put another, uh, w, I mean, um, HICFA put another drug on there, but when it went to Congress for them to sign off on this, Congress kicked one of those drugs out that was a psychotropic drug. Anybody want to guess what drug that was that Congress said we don't want on the list? Caffeine. Caffeine, caffeine is a psychotropic, mind-altering drug. And Congress did not want to be classified as using a psychotropic drug in their coffee as they're sitting there making decisions. Oh, did you know Congressman so-and-so takes psychotropics? He drinks coffee or Dr. Pepper with caffeine. So, yes, caffeine is a psychotropic. Um, but this is interesting. Neuro neuroscientists around the globe agree that physical activity, exercise, is the best medication to maintain brain health throughout one's lifespan. Exercise improves the structure, function, and connectivity of your brain. <clears throat> there are many reasons that exercise is good for your brain. These include increases blood flow, which improves cere uh, cerebrovascular health, the release of neuro neurotropic uh, factors like BDNF, which stimulates the growth of new neurons, and the benefits of glucose and lipid metabolism, which bring nourishment to the brain. What is it? Exercise. People who regularly perform aerobic exercise, i.e. running, jogging, brisk walking, swimming, and cycling, have greater scores on neuro, uh, neuropsychological functions and performance tests that measure certain cognitive functions, such as attentional control, inhibitory control, cognitive flexibility. There's a lot of people out there who don't have good cognitive flexibility. 
uh, working memory, declarative memory, spatial memory, and information processing speed. Does anybody up there ever have problems with information processing speed? Yeah, yeah you're just, it just doesn't work as well as it used to. You know, we're just, it just doesn't crunch as well as it used to. Well, exercise improves information processing speed. And you'll actually find out how quick it does. Now, it's interesting. Duke University. Who's ever heard of Duke University? There's a guy there. His name's Dr. Walter Kempner. Genius guy. He came from Germany. He's also a biochemist. I think it was PhD. He was in biochemistry. And so he looked at exercise in little humans and big humans, children and adults. And so he found in children that children were exercising four times a day. Morning recess, recess after dinner. Now I'm a country boy, dinner's at the noon meal. Um, so exercise after dinner, exercise in the afternoon, recess in the afternoon, and then the kids went home and played, did chores in the afternoon. Well, obviously that's been a while with the issue of chores. So he then looked at the exercise of big humans, adults. And he started implementing the four times a day that kids exercise to the four times a day that adults exercise. And he found that numerous health issues improved if the adults exercised four times a day. Now, who's heard of Loma Linda Medical School? Loma Linda found that a 20-minute power walk lowers the blood sugar more than one shot of insulin. Now, is that not cu cool? That's huge. So which would you rather have, insulin or exercise four times a day? And so that's what Kempner did, and that's why he was so successful in reversing type 2 diabetes and even helping stabilize type 1 diabetes, is he found that many health problems, if he would exercise the adult four times a day, so I tell people, start out with five minutes, four times a day. Then go to 10 minutes, four times a day. Go to 20, 15 minutes, four times. Your goal, 20 minutes, four times a day. But Walt, I don't have time to do that. So what you want to do? Take drugs, deal with the side effects, deal with the disease, or figure out how to get time to fill the car with fuel or exercise four times a day. So as we look at information processing speed, if we'll exercise, four times a day, and they actually find that when you exercise, your information processing speed increases for two, for two hours after you exercise. Isn't that cool? Wow. So if you, if, got any kids in here? Are there any kids in here? Okay, just you. Anybody in school? I've gone back to school. I'm working on another degree. So if you want to get a good test, exercise before the test your information processing speed will increase for two hours. The transient effects of exercise on cognitive, uh, cognition include improvements in the most, most executive functions, like attention, having problems with the kids paying attention, having problems with your spouse paying attention. Maybe they just need to exercise more. Attention, working memory, cognitive flexibility, inhibitory control, Problem solving and decision making. Do you find as we get older we're having problems with problem solving more so? It could be we just need to exercise some. And here we are in information processing speed for a period of up to two hours after exercising. And that's pretty cool. So if you're exercising four times a day, that's eight hours of improvement in processing speed. Number three, adequate hydration. Our brains depend on proper hydration to function optimally. Now, I have people who say, I just don't do water. One of my firefighters, what was it, two weeks ago, Mary Lee? Two weeks ago, one of my firefighters had an acute episode. He was at the fire hall. Um, and they came in, and we thought we were gonna have to, they, they were going to have to fly him out. Uh, but we ended up just transporting him to the local hospital. And, um, and actually, Mary Lou and I were at church when it happened. And so after, the ch after church, we went by the hospital to check on him. And two of the firefighters had gone in and were with him there at the ER. And as I was walking in, they were leaving. <clears throat> and they said, we got to go get him some Pepsi. 
because he wouldn't drink any water at the ER. This guy does not drink water. He says it will rust his pipes. He says, water rust pipes. I don't want my pipes rusted. He does not drink water. He drinks Pepsi. That's all this man will drink, Pepsi. And so here he's in the ER. They're trying to hydrate him in the ER. He refuses to drink their water. The firefighters had to go out, buy him a Pepsi, and come back so he could hydrate himself with Pepsi. Uh, I have people say, well, I hydrate myself with coffee. It's got water in it. Uh, I don't have this anymore. I, I went back to East Tennessee 20 years ago, and I'm not getting this as I was when I first went back home, but people would say, I'm hydrating myself with moonshine. <laughs> it's got water in it. Um, but a lot of people depend on their hydration on soft drinks. Or how about sweet tea? Y'all know what sweet tea is? Sweet tea? We say sweet tea? You understood me, didn't you? Yeah, that's how North Carolina say it. <laughs> do y'all drink, do they, do they drink sweet tea here? A, a gallon of sweet tea at home is two to three cups of sugar per gallon. Does it have water in it? It does. And so people think, well, they're hydrating themselves. That's not a good source of water, y'all. Um, so our brain depends on proper hydration to function optimally. Our lungs depend on water. Our, every organ in our body depends on water. To, brain cells require a delicate balance between water and various elements to operate. And when you lose too much water, that balance is disrupted. Your brain cells lose efficiency. So we've got to drink adequate water. We've got to have hydration. They tell us that for every cup of coffee, for every cup of soft drink with caffeine, you're going to have to replace it because it's a diuretic. You've got to replace it with six cups of water or whatever that volume is that you just drank in the soft drink. You need now six times that amount of water to replace the amount of water you lost through the, dehyd through the diuretic effect of the caffeine. Years of research have found that when we are parched, we have more difficulty keeping our attention focused. So let's go back to our kids today. Could it be they're not drinking enough water when we have problems with attention issues with kids? Possibly. How about ourself? Dehydration can impair short-term memory function and the recall of long-term memory. I, did a, I was involved in a study several years ago. It was a three-week study. <clears throat> We did labs four times a day for seven days. Multiple different types of labs. One of the items we were monitoring the hydration. Everybody in the study was dehydration, was dehydrated every lab uh, for that, uh, the four times a day for seven days. All of us, every single one of us were dehydrated. The second week, they had us change, and what we did is we just normal what we drank. The second week, they had us do body weight divided by two. See, University of California at Davis found that it takes a half a gallon of water to run a five-year-old. Now, we're bigger than when we were five years old, so we need more than that, up to 128 pounds. But that's just to sit on the couch. If you're, if you're living in South Florida and it's sweating or... or out there mowing the yard, working in the garden, or whatever, you're going to need more than just that 64 ounces if you're 128 pounds or less. But if you're over 128 pounds, it's body weight divided by two, that many ounces. So let's say you weigh 200 pounds, how many ounces of water do you need? 100, but that's to sit on the, on the couch. The state of Tennessee tells me I'm supposed to drink a gallon of water a day because I'm a firefighter, proactively in case I have a house fire today, or like... Really, was it last week or week before last I did the, the wildland fire? Anyway, we did a good-sized wildland fire up the side of the mountain. And you can get dehydrated really fast up there in that hot wildland fire and climbing the mountain, and, and you, can, you can get dehydrated. So they have us drinking adequate water. So the second week, um, the professor had us do body weight, Divided by two for over 128 pounds, plus extra if we're extra act active, or for, 100 and, or for less than 128 pounds, that was 64 ounces, plus amount of activity, a little bit more water, 77% of the group was still dehydrated. The third week, 
And again, we're testing, we're doing labs four times a day, seven days a week. The third week, everybody was hydrated. And here's what he had us do. See, when you drink more than two to three ounces of water at a given time, it goes into free flow. It's like wash, it, who's ever grown motors? Tomatoes. <laughs> Y'all grown tomatoes? Okay, so what happens if you pour a five gallon bucket of water over your tomato plant? It's going to run off versus a drip line. So what they found is that if we drink more than two to three ounces of water at a given time, that excess over two to three ounces goes to free flow and we just urinate it off. So if you drink eight ounces of water, who's ever drank, just drank a cup of water? Who's ever drank one of these? Just plumb drank it right down. So, but let's say you do eight ounces. You're going to absorb two to three ounces, five to six ounces, it's just going to urinate off. And you can't count that. It's called free flow. And I learned that years ago in physiology, but sometimes you just don't put two and two together. And what we did that third week was, was identified by a guy who was good friends of Einstein. He was another physicist, he tells the time frame, but he was also from Florida. He was from Avon Park. And uh, he was another physicist. And this physicist found that if you'll just do this three to four times based on body weight, if you're a little person, three times, if you're a bigger person, four times, that much. Every, you know, three to four times, every half hour, except when you, 15 minutes before you eat, while you drink, to an hour after you drink. That's a whole other topic, what water does when we drink water with a meal because that's not good to drink with our meals. But if we did that, and we did that, that third week, everybody was hydrated. And that was 35, 36 people in that, in that study. Yes, sir? Is there um, any natural, I'm sorry, is there any natural additive that you can put in water to help your body assimilate it that you are aware of? Well, just water itself is pretty good. Water does a good job itself. Uh, you can put like trace minerals in your water and that will be, because see you got, let's go back to what we talked about at the very beginning. You got fats, proteins, carbohydrates. Then you have vitamins, which are the catalysts that kicks on fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. So to get fats, proteins, and carbohydrates to be running on eight cylinders, You've eaten adequate amounts of fats, proteins, and carbohydrates, but to get the full benefit out of the fats, proteins, and carbohydrates, you've got to have vitamins at eight cylinders to kick on the fats, proteins, and carbohydrates at eight cylinders. But in cor to, to kick on the vitamins at eight cylinders, even though you eat enough, you've got to have minerals at eight cylinders to kick on the, the vitamins and to kick on the others. What's the problem? Do we get ad adequate minerals today? You've got soil erosion. You've got hybrid seeds. Did you know that hybrid seeds only uptake about 40% of the nutrients out of the soil that heirloom seeds do? You're only getting 40 cents on a dollar. Plus then you have processed foods. And so we don't get adequate mineralization, which means minerals are, eight, uh, are not running at eight cylinders. Therefore, even though you're eating, you're taking adequate vitamins, they are not going to be turned on to eight cylinders because they're not turned on to eight cylinders, even though you eat that adequate amount of fats, proteins, and carbohydrates, they're not gonna get kicked on to eight, to eight cylinders. Why? You didn't have enough mineralization. Minerals are very, it's a basic building block that we gotta have. And so yes, you could add trace minerals to that, and that's gonna be super good to help you. Um, but just water. Now, is there a difference in water? Yes, ma'am. Flavoring to the water. They have those little bottles of squirt flavors to water. Oh, flavors. Yes, flavors. It depends on what's in those flavors. Yeah. Is there sugar? Is there, you know, as long as if it's quality. Now, one of my favorite things to do, people will come to me and they'll go, I just don't do water. I don't like the taste of water. And so I say, well, let's try some. See, our taste buds are so perverted overstimulated by the other stuff we've been drinking. And so how do we get that stimulation? And so one of my favorite things to do is take essential oils. Let's say um, uh, 
essential oil of, of wild orange, uh, lemon, peppermint, tangerine, grapefruit. Those, tr those essential oils are a great way to make it taste better. Have you ever seen where people will take a bucket of water and they'll put, they'll, they'll cut up uh, strawberries are put in there? Or they'll cut up um, cucumbers and put in there? Pardon? Sage? Sage? Yeah. Um, you may say, well, but that's not optimum. Maybe it's not, but you got to negotiate. You do. you got to negotiate sometimes. And, and we were talking earlier. I like, plan, I, like, I like plan A. I really like plan A. But real quick, I found out that sometimes you just can't get everybody to do plan A. you got folks that are not even on the alphabet. I get people come in that do not do any fruit, period. I had someone just last week. No fruit. Can you imagine that? No bananas. No strawberries. No blueberries. No mangoes. I mean, isn't that easy? Nothing. I have people that will do, they'll do potatoes in the form of French fries, potato chips. They're doing their, their vegetables. Or pizza, they're doing their fruit with the t tomatoes. Um, they just don't do it. So you got to figure out, you got to negotiate with them people. At least get them to Z. And then you keep working with them. So it may not be optimum to put certain ways, but we got to do something. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Kind of a uh, question related to what she asked about the additive flavor additives to water. So what about a lot of things have sugar alcohols in it? Instead of, because I'm following a certain plan and I'm diabetic, mm -hmm. so I'm trying to eliminate the sugar and stuff. Mm -hmm. So is sugar alcohols okay? Like erythritol, stevia is not a sugar alcohol of the plant, but other maltitol, are they okay? And how do they affect the body and do they affect the sugar? Yeah, your second one diabetic. Is, the second one you just mentioned is the key. Stevia? Stevia. Okay. Yes. So who's ever heard of Melody Prettyman, cavernous? Seen her on 3ABN? I'll be out to there next week. Um, she has me coming out to uh, uh, Black Hills. And so she came in one time to pick up some supplies. She was doing, she's, in, she's a, a chef. Y'all may have watched her on 3ABN. And so she came in to get some stuff from Mary Lou and I. And we were talking, and she's from Texas. And you know that thing we talked about, sweet tea? Well, she missed drinking sweet tea. And I said, well, you can still do sweet tea. She said, how? And so Mary Lou went back and made her some stevia. You just take a quart of water, bring it to a boil, put in a heaping teaspoon of stevia leaves, uh, make an infusion, let it sit there for 30 minutes overnight. Make Y'all know what sun tea is? Stump tea, sun tea? Uh, you can do it with stevia. And... Um, it has a zero glycemic index. So it's perfectly fine for type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, whatever, whatever you're concerned about. And um, so Mary Lou made this sweet tea for her, and she says, I can do sweet tea again. I mean, she, but she did sweet tea out of stevia leaves. And so what you can do is take stevia leaves, you can make a tea with it, and then you can add it to whatever you're doing, and then that that then that water is sweetened through the stevia. And yes, you can do the powdered stevia, but that stuff's been processed. It's got an aftertaste, but the stevia leaves, I don't find has that bad taste. What about the sugar alcohol? I'd rather go, I'd rather just do it away with them guys. But are they, do they do something, you know, bad to the body? A lot of those guys do. A lot of them do. I'd just rather stay away from those guys. Yes, yeah, there's just problems with those guys, I really believe, for brain function. Yes? How's the liquid stevia? Liquid stevia is fine. Uh, some people just find the liquid stevia can have an aftertaste, but if you make your own liquid stevia from the stevia leaves, it just looks like, uh, y'all grow it here, stevia will grow here, um, and you just chop it up, it looks like peppermint, and you can grow it like peppermint out in your, out in your yard, and you can make your own stevia. Another question. 
Yes? How did you measure the dehydration? Uh, how did we measure the dehydration? We looked at conductivity. Um, see, the body has, we looked at it a couple ways, but the biggest way that we saw was measuring conductivity. The body has an electrical system. Uh, if it didn't, you couldn't do an EKG. You couldn't do an EEG. So it's, let's go back to chemistry class. Do you remember in chemistry class, the professor took a flask and he put in distilled, well, he, he went and took a, a light bulb and he plugged it into the wall socket. The neutral was solid, but the two hot wires were bare and they stuck it into the flask. And then, and y'all will understand this because where you live, you live here right near the beach. And so what he did is he, is he started pouring distilled water in the, the flask. Is it going to transfer, or are you going to have power going from one to the other? No, because you have no mineralization for the electrons to move. So the professor started adding salt. And as he added the salt, you then start having mineralization. A current can go through the minerals, hit the other wire, and the light bulb come in, came on. And the more salt he poured in, the higher the salinity, the brighter the bulb got. And then he started pouring in more distilled water, the salinity went down, and the bulb's electricity or the brightness went down. Well, the same is true with our body. And so we can measure conductivity, and as we measure conductivity, it goes up and down based on two major functions, and that is water and mineralization. The major mineral that affects it is salt. And so as the person's salinity, as their conductivity goes up, that's dehydration. And so when we bring that conductivity to normal where it belongs, we can measure the hydration with measuring conductivity as long as we're, we're also at the same time monitoring or controlling the mineralization at the same time. It's kind of like if you took a blow dryer and you plugged it into that wall socket right there, it's going to run fine. You plug it to the battery in your car, it's not going to run. It's not enough current. But if you took it over to Australia, it's going to burn it up because they're running 200 and something volts. And so our body can run high voltage and conductivity will, will measure that and what has a direct relationship on that is hydration. Okay, so dehydration can impair short-term memory function and the recall of long-term memory. The ability to perform mental arithmetic, like calculating whether or not you'll be late for work, uh, if you hit the snooze button for another 15 minutes, is compromised when your fluids are low. That's psychology today. And so, do you ever have problems making a decision and you made a bad decision? You just didn't calculate right? Well, it could be that you're just dehydrated, according to psychology today. The effects of dehydration on the brain function depends on the severity of dehydration. Mild dehydration may adversely affect mood, energy levels, or the ability to concentrate. This is psych central. Do you ever have a problem with concentration? It could be that you're just dehydrated. That simple. Severe or prolonged dehydration may cause serious cognitive impairment, delirium, permanent brain damage, or even death, according to Mayo Clinic. Now, this is, who's ever read Dr. Batman Jotty's research? If you want to learn hydration, look at Batman Jotty, uh, Your Body's Many Cries to Water. Excellent resource. Batman Jotty says a mere 2% drop in water can trigger fuzzy short-term memory, trouble with basic maths, and difficulty focusing on the computer screen or on a printed page. Batman Jotty continues. He is a medical doctor. He's, he's dead now, but he did some really good research on hydration. Every function inside the body is regulated by and depends on water. So if you're dehydrated, it affects every function in the body to optimum function. Water must be available to carry vital elements oxygen, hormones, and chemical messengers to all parts of the body. We learned in nutrition that water is the train car that carries nutrients throughout the body. And if you're dehydrated, you don't have adequate train cars to carry those nutrients throughout the body. Let's see here. Uh, without sufficient water to weigh all parts equally, some more re remote parts, distal parts of the body, will not receive the vital elements that water supplies. So we've got to be adequately hydrated uh, with water, not coffee, not soft drinks, not Dr. Pepper. Can anybody tell me where 
Uh, is 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 uh, Mountain Dew popular here? Do people do Mountain Dew here? Can anybody tell me where Mountain Dew was was uh, created? In the mountains, yes. Can you, can you tell me what city? Dew. <laughs> it's the dew in the morning. It's Knoxville, Tennessee. Knoxville, Tennessee is where Mountain Dew came from. The mountains, the Appalachians, the dew, and that's where it actually came from. Sunlight, another very important key to the body running properly. Vitamin D boosts cognitive acceleration. How many of y'all know what your vitamin D blood level is? People will say, well, I take 5,000 uh, you know, units of vitamin D a day. I had a lady come in, she took 5,000 units of vitamin D. There's another factor that you have to look at vitamin D. When I, last time I went to Africa, I took this doctor with me. He's a black physician out of South Georgia, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Davis. And as he spoke, we, and when we go, we teach physicians and other folks lifestyle medicine. And, and he told the guys there, he said, listen, he says, w he is a black feller. And he told the Africans, which in that part of Africa are black folks. And he said, we have sunglasses on our skin. He says it takes six times more exposure to sun to get the same amount of vitamin D as it does Walt. So it, the darker your pigmentation, whether you're from, you know, from if you're Hispanic, if you're Oriental, if, it, as it gets darker and darker, say, you're Jamaica? Bahamas. Bahamas, okay. You're in the back. Are you from Jamaica? Some Jamaica folks are really dark, like the folks in Africa. Well, those folks are going to take even more time than even y'all because y'all are lighter than, than the, the darker. And so this lady comes in, and she's Caucasian. So what's that tell you? Well, she should have more easy access. So she's taking 5,000 IUs a day. Um, she's, she's Caucasian. She works in landscaping. And her vitamin D blood level is 12. Now, as you know, vitamin D level, should, they tell us, should be between 30 and 100. Um, but Dr. Um, Arvo Kana, who's a neurologist, specializing in brain function, will tell you, he tells his patients he does not want their vitamin D blood level less than 60 for adequate cognitive function because of direct relationship by, by, for vitamin D and cognitive function. And so they say a 30 is good. Well, no, it's not if you want good co cognitive function. you got Dr. Ted Watkins in Washington, D.C., who's a good friend of mine. We used to work together. He's a surgeon. He now does lifestyle medicine. And he says, if you want good immune system, if you want good bone density, you need 80 to 100. And so you want to look at what is the blood level, not how much you take a day, but what is your blood level. And so we, we kept, and what happened with this lady, uh, we did, we did 5,000 twice a day over a three-month period. She went to 17. We did 40,000 a day, and she went to 24. Her problem was she was deficient in magnesium. If you don't have adequate magnesium, you can have problems with uh, having enough vitamin T. But be careful looking at the lab for magnesium because a lot of your hospitals will look at the blood serum. Uh, the majority of... Uh, only one and a half to two percent of your blood serum of your of your magnesium is in the serum. The majority it's in the RBC. So if you want a good quality test, an a more accurate test of your vitamin D level, you want to look at the RBC, the red blood cells. So vitamin D boosts cognitive acceleration. In a study led by scientists at the University of Manchester in England, they looked at vitamin D levels and cognitive performance in more than 3,100 men, ages 40 to 79, in eight different countries across Europe. The data showed that those people with lower vitamin D levels exhibited, and now again, how many? 3,100 people, and uh, age 40 to 79, 79, in eight different countries. Those that had lower vitamin D levels uh, exhibited slower cognitive processing speed. So you're having problems, remember where you put the keys? You have problems processing math or whatever decision making, it could just be your vitamin D level is low. That's simple. Vitamin D, vitamin D deficiency is a current epidemic in our society, affecting 90% of the world population. According to vitamin D expert Michael Hollick, 
we estimate that vitamin D deficiency is the most common medical condition in the world. It is clear that most people are not getting enough healthy sun exposure. Vitamin D deficiency increases brain degenerative processes. A study published in the Archives of Internal Medicine, this is really cool, y'all, look at this. Archives of Internal Medicine showed that those who are classified as vitamin D def uh, deficient uh, were 42% more likely to have cognitive impairment. That was just deficient. But meanwhile, those classified as severely deficient were 394% more likely to have cogni cognition or cognitive impairment. So you're wondering why you just can't think so good anymore? Or maybe your spouse can't think too good anymore? Or the kids aren't thinking too good and they just, why are they doing that? It could be that, that they're not getting sunshine. It could be that they don't have enough vitamin D. It could just mean that they need more vitamin D. The odds of cognitive impairment increase as vitamin D levels go down, says a study author, given that both vitamin D deficiency and dementia are common throughout the world, this is a major public health concern. Serotonin. And we probably need, yes? So is there, what do you ask your doctor to check? Sorry. What do you ask your doctor to check in terms of the magnesium? Just ask him to do a blood level vitamin D. So the it's blood a separate test. It's not, your vitamin D level is not part of your CBC, CBT, CBDC, with CBD, uh, C, oh, I can't even say it right. Uh, yeah, CBC with diff. It's not, a, it's not a, 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 a lipid test. It's a separate test that is just a vitamin D test, just like a, serotonin, just like a, a testosterone. And what about, the, you don't need to check for magnesium separately? If you do check the magnesium, check for an RBC. Oh, it's uh, just the RBC. It's just check. So you, most of your magnesiums are in a panel. Right. You know, your test is it's in a panel. And according to the hospital uh, lab, that's not as, a, as accurate. You want to ask for a separate test that looks at magnesium in the, uh, in the, um, uh, in the uh, red blood cells, RBC. Oh, okay, so does that come uh, with the RBC, or you have to ask specifically for ask magnesium for, in the RBC? You have to ask for a specific magnesium test. Yes. Thank you. Just like you would a homocysteine, C-reactive protein, those are separate tests. Okay, thank you. Yes? If we just go outside, but we are completely covered, and we put some protection, are we getting the vitamin D? You're going to get some vitamin D. You are. Uh, it's true that the more exposed you are, the more you're going, the more you're going to have. Um, so, like, expose yourself without uh, some protection, like at 10 a.m.? Oh, that's or a good like question. Ten minutes? Uh, yes. So the abdomen or the they heart? used to tell us that we just needed 15 minutes, but that's big. When I got out of school, they told us if you had over 32, that was dangerous. No, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. And so we're now saying yes, you need more than just 15 minutes of sun exposure a day. Um, but adequate sun exposure. Pardon? Adequate sun exposure. At, you want adequate sun exposure. So, like, people will come into me and they'll say, "Well, do I need something for my cholesterol?" I don't know. What's the blood level? Walt, do I need to take something for my triglycerides? I don't know. What's your blood level? I had a lady call me from South Carolina and she says, my husband's bleeding from the rectum. What do I need to do? I don't know. I can't look in there. <laughs> you know, is it, he has internal hemorrhoids? Does he have ulcerative colitis? Does he have a, a polyp that's bleeding? Does he have cancer? So you've got to look specifically and see what, and every, it's not a cookie cutter. Everybody's different. Like this, like this lady, she's taking 40,000 units a day of, of, uh, of uh, I use, I'm sorry, I use uh, 40,000 units of, of vitamin D. And it wasn't raising her like, because she needed more magnesium. Or could they need K2? And so you've got to look at e each person different, I mean, individually and see what to do. Just, yes? Okay, so what you do is you want to do a lab test. So the question is, what do I mean by blood level? So you go to your doctor and say, Doc, can you do a vitamin D level on me? Now, is it D or D3? Does it matter? Is there a difference? Okay, so yes, there's D2 and D3 that you take, but the blood level is, uh, the lab is just a vitamin D lab. So yes, there's a difference between vitamin, or bet between taking D2, D3. D2 is only an, a plant-based product. 
D3 can either be an animal or a plant base. It can be from, it can be from, um, uh, from mushrooms. It can be from uh, uh, seaweed. Uh, it can be from, some people you know, may use you know, lanolin. Now lanolin is the oil off of sheep wool. Um, so there's different sources of D3. Uh, and D3 lasts in the blood twice as long. Um, serotonin and brain function. And do we need to finish on this one tonight? Or Yes, so we'll finish on this. There's so much to share. So serotonin and brain function. Serotonin is an important chemical and neurotransmitter in the human body. It is believed to help regulate mood and social behavior. Is there an issue with social behavior out there in America today? There was several years ago, that's for sure. Um, it could just be they need more sunshine. Uh, appetite and digestion. Sleep. Memory. Now, how does serotonin affect sleep? So you've got to look at the physiology. So what happens is as we go outside in the daytime, well, before we go outside, for breakfast, we eat, say, two tablespoons of flaxseed. Ground, eat within 15 minutes. Flaxseed has what in it? Tryptophan. So we put tryptophan in the blood, <clears throat> and then as we go outside, sun, the ultraviolet rays comes through the eye, stimulates the pineal gland to convert the tryptophan into serotonin. Then in the evening, if we don't eat a big supper, if you eat a big supper, you don't make as much serotonin, you don't make as much melatonin from the serotonin. Uh, and if you go to bed when it gets dark um, and don't wait till midnight, one o'clock, the earlier you go to bed, the more your pineal gland converts the serotonin into melatonin. Now, melatonin does not put you to sleep. Melatonin helps you stay asleep. Now, this is really interesting. And do you have questions you want to ask God when you get to heaven? I do. Like, why is it that when you get up at night, and the melatonin's really pumped up good because you got you ate your flaxseed, you got your sunshine, you, you didn't eat a big supper, you went to bed on time, but then you wake up at night to go to the bathroom and you turn on the, the light, it turns off your melatonin. White light. Any color of light other than red turns off your melatonin. So when you get up at night, you want to get a red light, click it on, and go to the bathroom. And then go back to bed and it doesn't turn off your melatonin, so it helps you stay asleep. But this is the question I have for God. Why is it? This is really cool. So the number one researcher on melatonin in the world, he's published four, over 4,000 uh, studies on this, over 4,000 uh, studies he's published on this issue of melatonin in animals. He took his rats, or mice, up on top of the laboratory one night when it was a full moon and he had that melatonin just pumping in the mice and then he took the cover off of them in a full moon. What color is the moon? White. But it did not turn off the melatonin. Is that not cool? Moonlight, which is white, does not turn off melatonin. But all the other sources of white light do. I mean, I just... I don't understand it. We, we can ask God. We can learn, learn for eternity. Isn't that cool? Natural light. It's natural light. natural light. Yeah, but daylight, natural light, the sunlight turns it off. Night light doesn't. The moonlight doesn't. I don't understand it. But that's what he found in his research. So, yes, serotonin helps with sleep, helps with memory. Now, this is interesting. There was, an ar there was a, a country in Africa, and their army got SAD. Now, who's lived up north before? Do they have SAD up there, seasonal affective disorder? Yeah, they do. I, Mary Lou and I are in Alaska back uh, August last year, and they deal with that big time. Okay, where'd you live? In Jersey. Well, that's not as far up, but it's easy to get. 
Absolutely. But Africa? Who's been to Africa? They got plenty of light in Africa. Plenty of sunshine. The whole army got SAD. So they're trying to find out what, and they brought in this expert, and he's looking around, and he goes, why do you got sunglasses on? Well, that's the new uniform policy. So he says, take off the sunglasses. And so they took off the sunglasses, and guess what? The SAD went away because they stopped the ultraviolet light from coming in the eyes with the sunglasses. That means if you have glasses that change colors, to get dark when you go outside, that stop the ultraviolet from coming in, that can affect your serotonin production. So it's a problem. So, <clears throat> affects memory and issues of depression. Serotonin uh, deficiency, uh, symptoms, poor memory, low mood, difficulty sleeping, low self-esteem, anxiety. Are people outside today? Or are they inside all the time? Inside. They're inside. Even if they don't work, they're inside. Sitting there watching TV, on their computer, whatever. Aggression. Low serotonin can affect aggression. Okay, so... We've run out of time, y'all. Any other questions before? Yes. Yeah. Organic corn and organic wheat. Is that better than the regular? Does it have Roundup? Yes. So if it's organic, it is not supposed to have Roundup. But organic does not mean that it's high, it does not mean that it's heirloom. It could be either super hybridized as wheat. So the European wheat has around 14 chromosomes. Our American wheat has 42 chromosomes. We've super hybridized it. Or the corn, it may not be heirloom, it's hybrid. And so, I remember the study in North Carolina found that hybrid corn, and it was actually corn was the big one in this study, you have 40% uptake with hybrid nutrition-wise versus the heirloom. And so just because it's organic, it should not have the Roundup, but it still has the issues of the chromosomes or the, uh, the hybridization. And what is the English walnut? The English walnut, that's the one you usually see in the store. Oh, okay. It's kind of a light brown in color. Your black walnut is darker in color. But let me tell you an East Tennessee inside secret. Black walnuts, to me, are bitter. But come to East Tennessee in the mountains, our black walnuts, oh, they're, they're good. Why are those others somewhere else are, are bitter to me? Chill at night. Pardon? Chill at night. Is that what it is? I think so. Okay. But it's the, he says it's the chill at night. Yes, sir. Um, I think the answer to the moon and the sun is because it, the sun turns off your melatonin because it's saying get up because it's natural light, so it's telling you to get up. It's morning. Yeah. Now go back to sleep. That's exactly right. I, I yeah, I mean, there's things, you know, why does it get dark at night? God turned off the sun, so we go to sleep. So I believe he's exactly correct. It's just understanding the physiology. Uh, walking 20 minutes four times a day. Does that include walking around your house at work? You want it aerobic. You'd like it aerobic. Uh, that's where we see the best benefit. It's not strolling. Now, strolling is no, better not than stroll. nothing. Let's say you have to move fast at work. Pardon? If you have to move briskly at work. Yes, briskly is going to do it. Uh, and then I like where you go fast for three minutes, slow for one minute, fast for three minutes, slow for one minute. Or who's watched Barbara O'Neill? Barbara talks about going fast for 30 seconds and go slow. Fast for 30 seconds. Whichever way you do it, you want that, that, that intermittent training and where you're going fast, slow, fast, slow. It actually was better for the heart, we learned in the late 90s, early 2000s, is actually better for the heart to do that intermittent training. Is that a run walk? It can, it can be a run walk, absolutely. Yeah, if you want to get highfalutin, y'all know what highfalutin is? Okay, if you want to get highfalutin, what you do is you get an Omron, and it's got a watch, you put a band around your heart, and you take 220 minus your age, that's maximum heart rate, and then start out with just 65% of that number. So let's say it's 110. 
And so, and so then you'll do five beats above, five beats below. And so that's, that's 105 to 115. That's your target range. And so you exercise as fast as you can, can up to 115. Once it gets to 115, your, your watch beeps, and then you slow down and just stroll. It goes back down to 105. When it hits 105, then you go fast again, and you just keep it in that target range of, of 10 beats, five beats above, five beats below of that 65%, then go to 70, go to 75, go to 80. Don't go over 85%, over 80%. That's where I see the maximum. But folks, most folks don't have that. And so if you'll just do three minute fast, one minute slow, three minutes fast, one minute slow, you get good results. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I uh, got another question over here. So I recently was told just by a person working at a health food store that when you're taking vitamin D, they're finding that um, people are taking so much vitamin D, it's causing cholesterol problems, and now they're wanting people to take vitamin K to counteract that. Have you heard of that? I haven't, but I do know that vitamin K helps the absorption of vitamin D. I haven't heard that actually I, it, I, the research shows just the opposite of that. And the reason is, is there's a direct relationship between vitamin D and HDL. There can be a direct relationship. So if you have a high vitamin D that can pull up your HDL, that's the good cholesterol, which means that's like the cops that get rid of the bad guy, the LDL, and puts, them in, puts handcuffs on them and takes them to jail to the liver to get, you know, to get rid of the LDL. Uh, if you have a low vitamin D, it can pull your HDL down. Oh. Therefore, you can have increased LDL and it raise your cholesterol. So the research I've seen on that actually shows the inverse. So it's pretty safe to just go ahead and take the vitamin D. Absolutely. Okay. And, and people are scared to death of being over 100. There's a doctor in Atlanta. If you have cancer, she's going to push you up to 205. Um, and so if you, let's say you have osteoporosis. Um, you know, I know it says 30 to 100, but remember, when I got out of school, they told us don't go over 32. And what's the problems of it over 100? There's two things that can happen that I've heard. One, it, it's a minority, very short, very, very little minority. You could get kidney stones, but very few people do. As the doctor in Atlanta says, I can fix kidney stones uh, because she does this for cancer patients. She said it's a whole lot easier to fix kidney stones than it is uh, stage four cancer. The other even, even less that ever happens is it can cause arrhythmias, but that's very rare. And even the kidney stones are pretty rare. Okay, thank you. Yes. So still talking about the vitamin D? Okay, yes. <laughs> so is a pharmaceutical, because I'm low in D, I'm like low in the norm, like, I'm, like maybe I'm about 30. Yes, so that's low. If I, I'm taking a pharmaceutical grade from the doctor, like 50,000? It's 50,000. Or 50,000, right. okay. Mm -hmm. So is a pharmaceutical grade different than if you buy a supplement in a store, you know, or it's online? Same. Is it the same thing? It's going to be the same. same. quality? If, and if I'm not absorbing it, why am I not absorbing the, the D that I take? And I take K, so how much K do you take? To the 50,000 yes. D, and I know you're not a doctor or anything. So the help. issue with K, K2, or MK7, yeah, K2, K2 is even the best. K2, seven, yeah. You don't want to be really over 300 um, you, you, of that a day. Uh, that's the problem with seeing D and K together because you're limited in how much you can take based on the amount of K there. I'd rather see I take separate separately. Yeah. And it's the same. It really is. You're taking, and a lot of times, the years ago, they would give you 50,000 a day or every other day. Now they just give you 50,000 a week. That's what I was told yes. a week. And you can, you know, you can take more than that. During COVID, uh, we saw physicians prescribing 50,000 three times a day. It's 150,000 units a day um, for four, four to five days, then going to 80,000 uh, during the, the rest, or some going back down to the, 50,000 for the balance. So how much K to the D? What was the ratio? It's not. It's just you need this much K, okay. 2 to 300, and then you need whatever D it takes to get you up. Now, it can also be the reason you're not absorbing it is your, is your magnesium is low. Mary I Lou. take that too. I don't know if I'm taking enough, but I take magnesium also. Well, it's not how much you, it's not just taking magnesium. The it's, form. Do you have enough? Or it could be the form. form. So here's what you do to test your magnesium. Go to bowel tolerance. 
Do you know what green apple two step is? When you eat too many, too much magnesium, it gives you the two step. <laughs> That's what happens when you eat too many apples. It gives you the green apple two step. So you go to bowel tolerance till you have a, a loose stool, then you back up to bowel tolerance. That's going to get you well saturated. So the mag citrate. And uh, yes, you can do an RBC to see what your magnesium level is. But usually if you get your magnesium up where it belongs. But I have people who come in and just 400 uh, milligrams of magnesium gives them a loose which stool. Which form? Because there's, uh, there's so many different forms of there magnesium. Is. Which form is the best one to take? Yes. Most the, absorbable. Magnesium is like a rifle and a shotgun. Let's say you're having cognitive function. Uh, a neurologist is going to give you magtine or a th theonate, magnesium Maybe. theonate. Okay. Uh, that's going to be it's like a rifle to fix the okay. brain working well. Okay. Citrate's more like a shotgun. It's going to help your nerves, your muscles, your bowels. It's going to help your brain, your heart. So I like citrate. It's a really good one to use. And what and about glycinate? That's another one folks will use too. Yep, you can use that one also. Um, but Mary Lou. about it being a fat-soluble vitamin, he said, to take yes. it with some peanut butter or it's something. It's true. So, some of your so Mary Lou's mentioning that um, a physician was telling her regarding her mother that, she, you know, you need to take vitamin D along with a fat. And, and that's why so many of your vitamin Ds out there, there today is mixed with a fat, uh, an oil or something that makes it absorb better. And so if that pill from the dot isn't mixed with an oil, you're not going to have good absorption. So that's another reason for absorption. Yes. Yes, sir. So the question is transdermal versus PO. And yes. So I had a guy come in and uh, his, he was having problems with the restless leg. Well, we know that 75% of restless leg is from magnesium deficiency. Number two is dehydration, number three is potassium, number four is iron. And we're seeing more and more iron today because people just aren't eating their greens. But, so this guy, I mean, you know, I just, he just seemed to be magnesium as an issue. And, and so, but he couldn't even do 400 milligrams because he'd have a loose stool. So I called a buddy of mine out in uh, Washington, a physician out in Washington. He said, give him magnesium oil. And I hadn't heard of it then. That was back 20 years ago. And he said, do a magnesium spray, which now I use a rollerball. I like rollerballs better than spray. And uh, he said, put that on there and see how well it does for his restless leg. And transdermally, it goes in, like you're like soaking in Epsom salt. Or, uh, or doing a magnesium oil spray or rollerball transdermally. But what happens is you're going to get to that specific area even faster transdermally than PO by mouth. But the problem with, so that is good to deal with that problem. Let's say you're having a cardiac issue. This doctor uses it for angina. He uses it for heart health. It's excellent for patients who are in heart failure to use magnesium oil, say four times a day. Transdermally, you're going to get more magnesium into the heart very quickly. But you're not systemically going to get it to the brain, to the others. You're just getting transdermally to that region right there, where PO is going to get it systemic, as long as they can have tolerance, bowel tolerance. Yes, sir. Well, y'all, I've plumb gone over time. Um, Y'all know what plum is totally? Um, come on up and talk to folks. What are we going to do tomorrow? Who's? Yeah, come on up and let's talk about tomorrow. Well, are you going to finish the laws of health tomorrow? Pardon? You're going to finish this tomorrow? Whatever y'all want. Okay. And um, Saturday 2 to 4, 
We're going to talk on lifestyle planning, how to make change for a healthier you. So everybody, be sure to come back. And then Sunday, from 10 to 1, 1.30, we're going to talk how to effectively address stress, anxiety, and depression, and optimal immunity, and how to achieve it. And um, I hope everybody will be there. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you, Walt. That was very inspirational. <laughs> and I have a couple of announcements. Um, you can keep your folders. Keep your folders. But uh, if you got pens when you came in, turn in the Sonia, did I cover all the announcements? We're sorry if we were putting the mic in your face when you were asking a question. Is that we are live on YouTube, and a lot of people were, were questioning, what are they asking? What are they asking? So they want to know what your questions are, and then what Walt's responses are. So when tomorrow, when you have a question, just wait till you get the mic, and then you, you'll be able to speak into the mic so that the people who are watching online can also hear what your questions are and what the responses are, so that they could learn as well. Thank you. Thank you. So, so let's pray, and then we can go home and come back tomorrow. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this knowledge we have gained tonight. We thank you, dear God, for being with us and providing us with uh, a speaker who knows all about health. And dear God, we pray that you will be with us as we continue to worship you, that we will always follow your directions in our life, in our lifestyles. And pray with you that you will be with each person as we go home tonight. Keep us safe. And I pray that you will bring each of us back tomorrow. This I pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.